Welcome to another Monday talk. We're excited you're here. This is our, our last summer series talk, but I'm going to share some upcoming events. We've got a big, um, great schedule of programming and exhibitions coming up this fall and spring. Um, we're excited you're here. Thanks for joining us. And thanks to Dr. Jamie Gunderson for being here. And also Olivia Miller, our curator, is going to chime in at the end as well. Um, yeah. Before we get started, uh, we always want to respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, uh, with Tucson being home to the Atham and Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign nations and indigenous communities through education offer offerings, partnerships, and community service. Um, the University of Arizona now has that new official land acknowledgement, um, and, which is an important step, but there's always more we can do. So I encourage you to research whose land you are on and consider ways that you can decolonize your own uh, views of US history, as always. So welcome in uh, to this summer series where we look at art and are also considering some of the historical and cultural and social contexts of uh, the artworks we're examining. This uh, Today I'm going to introduce Jam Dr. Jamie Gunderson in just a moment. Uh, and before we do that, Here's a couple Zoom reminders. We're all experts at Zoom now. Uh, we're gonna be continuing to have a lot of virtual talks this year. Um, and you can remember that you can always adjust your settings to see the speaker and the slides side by side. Select speaker view, play around and figure out what works best for you. And like I mentioned, we are excited to start rolling out fall events. Uh, one of the more exciting, if you're on our email list, you've seen that we've announced we'll be reopening on October 24th. Uh, it's a little later than some due to some construction that's happening, uh, a revamp in the courtyard in front of the museum. So once that's complete, we'll be really excited to open you in with a big new exhibition that we have been preparing for, for quite a while now called The Art of Food from the collections of Jordan D. Schnitzer and his family foundation. So Get ready for a lot of fun food programming and talks this year, uh, as well as in the near future, art trivia uh, the, for the dog days of summer is coming up this Thursday. And then at, in September, uh, our next talk will be uh, highlighting Dr. Chris Desindio and you meet Dr. Yumi Shirai from here at UA talking about um, a new exhibition by Artworks artists, artists with intellectual and developmental disabilities and a project they did with um, UA art and visual culture education students. So that's all a mouthful, but a really exciting interdisciplinary project focusing on food and food stories uh, coming up in September. Today, uh, as you know, because you signed up for this talk, we're gonna be looking at uh, what, the Bible, what the art gets wrong about the Bible. Uh, depictions of the New Testament in particular. And we're here with Dr. Jamie Gunderson, who holds a BA from the University of Arizona in Religious Studies with a minor in Classics, uh, and then went on to get an MA from the University of Kansas in, uh, sorry, in Religions of the Ancient Mediterranean and Near East, and an MA and PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in Religions of the Ancient Mediterranean. And today she's joining us from George Mason University where she teaches and researches. Her research focuses on moral philosophy, emotion, and embodied cognition in early and late uh, antique Christianity. So if you have questions throughout the talk or comments, feel free to chime in in the chat and we'll also have time for some discussion at the end. Um, but with that, I will pass the mic and the screen over to you, Dr. Gunderson. Thanks for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's so great to come back to my roots, right, and return home, so to speak, right? Uh, the U of A is where my journey into religious studies began, so I'm really excited to be able to talk to everyone today. And thank you all in the audience for um, coming out to, to watch or to see the talk. So let me share my screen here. Let's see if I can figure out what I'm doing. 
All right, can you guys uh, all see my slide or the slide on the screen? Excellent. All right, so uh, let's just jump right in here. So for centuries, artists have drawn on inspiration from biblical stories, right? So the crucifixion of Jesus is perhaps the most common subject in all of Western art, right? The work that you're looking at on the screen is of course from the collection uh, at the U of A, and it's part of the very famous altarpiece of Ciudad Rodrigo. And if you haven't seen it, you all should go check it out. But in addition to scenes of the crucifixion, other popular biblical episodes line the walls of countless spaces of worship and museums worldwide. Among the most popular, and all of which you can see in the UAMA's collection, are uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden, this one here by Salvador Dali, also the famous scene of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac, the Annunciation with the angel appearing to Mary, right, to announce her pregnancy, uh, and the ubiquitous image of Madonna and child. But scenes like these are powerful, right? They can awaken imaginations, they illuminate new insights and modes of piety. Some of these scenes are so powerful, in fact, that they have become the dominant way that we think about stories from the Bible. So my talk today focuses on instances in which the narratives of visual art have supplanted the narratives of the biblical text, or in instances in which art privileges one biblical narrative over another. Artists, of course, right, can't help avoid interpreting their subject matter in very significant ways, but sometimes instances of artistic visual elaboration are so consistently repeated and reproduced that they shape our perception and understanding of figures and episodes from the Bible. So uh, over the course of my talk, what I'd like to do is basically two things. First, explore some images. And then second, explore those images in relation to some texts. So we'll look closely at three examples today of New Testament scenes and figures. The first one that we'll address is the so-called conversion of Paul. The second is the nativity scene. And the third are depictions of Mary Magdalene. So these three subjects have taken on a life of their own in their translation to visual media within the Western tradition. And as the title of my talk indicates, I'll be discussing what art gets wrong about the Bible. But more importantly, I'll gesture to why these discrepancies between biblical text and image matter. So let's begin our exploration with the Apostle Paul. So you may have encountered the proverbial Damascus Road experience, where you see the lights, you fall off your horse, you have a change of heart, and you abandon former ways. Like many contemporary idiomatic expressions, the Damascus Road experience originates in biblical literature. Specifically, it comes from the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Acts right narrates Paul's dramatic transformation from a persecutor of the followers of Jesus to becoming a follower of Jesus. Caravaggio's uh, The Conversion of St. Paul on the Road to Damascus arrestingly illustrates this moment. Thrown off his horse, the armor-clad apostle Paul lies on his back with arms outstretched toward the light coming down up from above. Right, the light cascades in from the right hand side of the image uh, across the horse and then falls down onto Paul's outstretched figure, emphasizing his moment of illumination. Caravaggio's painting captures the polar oppositional movement that we now commonly associate with conversion. Right, movement from low to high, from darkness to light, from blindness to vision, from old to new. Right. Or, as this scene has traditionally been read, a movement from Jewish works to Christian faith, right? a movement from sin to grace. I'm going to challenge this reading in just a minute, but images like Caravaggio's scene have had so much influence on the way that people have thought about and continue to think about Paul, his mission, and the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. 
So as I mentioned a moment ago, the narrative of the Damascus Road experience is based, uh, from, is based on the Book of Acts. So Acts was written sometime around the turn of the second century. Right? Scholars tend to date it somewhere between 95 and 125 CE. It was written by the same author who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to refer to this author as Luke, although a person named Luke almost certainly didn't write either text. But it's in Acts that we encounter this narrative about Paul. And we don't just get it once. We get it three times, right? It, Luke hammers it in there, right? So although there are some inexplicable discrepancies between the accounts in Acts, the basic story goes as follows. Paul, who was then called Saul, had become an antagonist of the early followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. From the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, he obtained the authority to travel to Damascus in order to arrest the followers of Jesus there. It was while he was on the road to Damascus that he experienced a blinding light and heard a voice from heaven, which then identified itself as Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Paul, uh, as a result of this episode, is blinded, and then he's led to Damascus by his companions. The two parts of this narrative are illustrated very nicely in this engraving by Martin Van Heemskerk, which is also from the UAMA collection. And on the far right of the scene, we can see Paul falling from his horse with a celestial light pouring down from the clouds, much like a Tucson monsoon. And uh, again, we find movement from low to high, dark to light, blindness to vision. In the center, uh, a blind Paul is led by his companions uh, to Damascus, right, where he'll eventually regain his sight as a follower of Jesus. So the movement in Van Heemskerk's engraving, as in Caravaggio's painting, highlights conversion as the content of this scene. This emphasis is repeated over and over in visuals of the Damascus Road experience. In this regard, two paintings are particularly instructive. We have Guido Reni's The Conversion of Saul, which is on the left-hand side of your screen, and Nicholas Bernard Le Pissier's The Conversion of St. Paul, which is on your right-hand side. In both of these scenes, Paul is again off his horse. Light from heaven breaks through the clouds and illumines his body as a very literal way to highlight his spiritual enlightenment. Right. Again, all of this imagery is playing on the movement associated with conversion. The takeaway for the viewer from these scenes is that although Paul is blinded, right, he sees the proverbial light, and a light that we're led to believe is the new religion we now call Christianity. Right? So Paul becomes the prototype of a true Christian convert. But there's something to note here, though. Well, there's a couple things to note. But there's something here to note, right? Nowhere in the narrative of Acts does a horse appear in Paul's experience, right? So since the 14th century though, artists uh, customarily have supplied a horse to enhance the drama of the scene. Occasionally, however, the horse is missing. Such is the case in this fabulous painting by Dominican, uh, Domenico Morelli um, of, of Paul's conversion. Although the painting lacks the mayhem of, the fallen, of Paul falling off his horse, there is still an immense amount of drama in the scene, right? So an outstretched Paul struck, by the ground, struck to the ground by a shaft of blinding light is a spectacle, right? But it's Paul's clearly unseeing eyes that are intended to provoke a response, highlighting this tension between blindness and vision, right? The past and the future, and thus Judaism and Christianity, right? So this scene, this tension is, is really palpable. This again, right, is, is the movement of conversion. So while we can critique the presence of a horse in most of these scenes as a departure from the biblical text, there is a far more pressing issue at hand. And that is that these visual depictions of Paul's transformation privilege one biblical text over another. So while the narrative of Acts has been consistently reproduced in art, Paul's own telling of his events in his letter to the Galatians has been consistently glossed over. 
In Galatians, Paul writes that he had some type of visionary experience of the resurrected Jesus that caused him to become a follower of the movement. So in the letter, Paul writes, God, who set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles. The term that Paul uses to refer to the nature of his experience is important because it gives us some insight into the type of event he's describing. Right? He uses the term to reveal, which in Greek carries the sense of an epiphany, right? an appearance of a deity. Unfortunately for us, Paul doesn't elaborate on what this epiphany entailed, hence why Luke feels the need to dramatize his experience. But what Paul doesn't say is also important. He never communicates that he fell off a horse, that he saw a light and was blinded, or that he heard the booming voice of Jesus from heaven. In fact, if we follow Paul's own description, it would seem that the epiphany was an appearance of Jesus himself. In 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, Paul lists all the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. It notes that last of all, he appeared to me also. So perhaps the scene of Paul seeing, even interacting with, not being blinded by the risen Jesus would be a more accurate representation of Paul's own experience. The incongruence between Paul's narration of events in his letters and Luke's narration of those same events in Acts has prompted scholars to question the historical reliability of Acts. As a result, Modern historians and biblical scholars have had little difficulty letting go of the particulars of Luke's narrative. Nonetheless, this image of Paul on the Damascus road is seared into, public, into popular consciousness. And Paul, as the paradigmatic Christian convert, remains the dominant narrative. But here's the rub. This narrative comes with historical repercussions. Artistic interpretations of the Damascus Road experience all presuppose two clearly perceived and sharply contrasting religious options, right? In the scene, Paul moves clearly from Judaism to Christianity. As a result of this reading, Paul's so-called conversion has sparked notions of what a true conversion ought to be, right? Paul is the, the quintessential subjectivity um, to mimic, right, in conversion. But throughout history, Paul's assumed movement from one pole, Judaism, to, a, to its opposite pole, Christianity, has been highlighted as a reason to maintain trenchant divisions between Christianity and Judaism, while fostering the idea that Judaism is a flawed religion inherently linked to sin. We see this, for example, in the written works of the fifth century church father, Augustine, as well as in the works of the reformer, Martin Luther. Both of these thinkers' views and interpretations of Paul have had, have had a monumental impact on the development of Christianity. Both thinkers constructed Christianity as the antithesis of Judaism, a construction which has justified legacies of anti-Judaism in Christian theology and practice. In short, the portrait of Paul as a quintessential Christian convert has contributed to a negative image of Judaism and played no small role in the history of anti-Semitism. But what if the Damascus Road experience didn't dramatically change Paul's religious affiliation as later artists have imagined? While folks of virtually every stripe now accept that Jesus was a Jew, Paul has taken his place as the first real Christian convert. But, Recent scholarly interpretations, particularly post-Holocaust, propose that there's little historical evidence that Paul ever left Judaism, much less converted to something we now call Christianity. In the mid-first century, when Paul was active, the Jesus movement was not distinct from Judaism, right? So if you could go back in time and talk to Paul about following Jesus outside or apart from Judaism, he would have no idea what you're talking about. And if you told him you're starting a new religion here, Paul, right? He would, he would disagree with you uh, completely, right? So instead of a conversion, right? From one religion to another, scholars now argue that Paul shifted positions within Judaism, right? A lateral move from one Jewish movement to another. 
This view uh, follows Paul's own language in Galatians, right? Paul explains, uh, as we've seen in this passage earlier, I've now just highlighted different words, right? That Paul, uh, he says he experiences a call, right? This terminology plays on language found in the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah. So let's quickly compare passages so you can see what I'm talking about. So again, here's Paul's own language in Galatians that we've already seen, right? He emphasizes he was set apart before he was born and called to proclaim Jesus to the Gentiles. So here are passages from Jeremiah and Isaiah. So Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5 reads, Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you to a pro as a prophet to the nations or Gentiles, right? The word for nations and Gentiles is the exact same word in Greek. And in Isaiah, the Lord called me before I was born. I will give you as a light to the nations or Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So both of the passages from the prophets use the language of being set apart or called from birth to refer to a prophetic calling from God to be a prophet to the nations. In other words, Paul's language places his outlook on his experience on the Damascus Road entirely within a Jewish self-understanding. Paul seems to have understood his mission as being divinely appointed, uh, a divinely appointed messenger to the Gentiles in fulfillment of the prophets within a Jewish framework. This means that Paul never ceased being Jewish or saw himself participating in the creation of a new religion, even when reaching out to Gentiles. As a result, many scholars now prefer to define Paul's Damascus Road experience as a prophetic calling rather than a conversion. But I want to emphasize here, right, this isn't just a stupid quibble over words, right? The way that we talk about things and the way that we present things matters. The scenes of the Damascus Road experience speak to the historical context in which sharp distinctions between religious options make sense. Right, so in Van Heemskirk's time, as in Caravaggio's time, as in the times of the other artists, the dividing lines between Christianity and Judaism are clearly drawn, right? And the narratives of Christian supersessionism, right? The idea that uh, Christianity is superior to Judaism were commonplace. So because the notion of conversion rings true in the historical context of these artists, as well as in our own historical context, it makes it seem like conversion was always the case, right? But these ideas and distinctions that fill the scenes that we've been looking at have been superimposed on a first century context where they don't make sense. So thinking about Paul's experience as a prophetic call enables us to take seriously Paul's own background rather than the one that these artists provide for him. Okay, example two. The nativity. The traditional nativity scene, right, is one of, I think, the most familiar uh, images, uh, particularly uh, one of the most familiar parts of Christmas. And uh, Jan Gossert's early 16th century adoration of the kings illustrates the scene quite well. So here we have the baby Jesus held by Mary, who's dressed in an enveloping blue robe. And as we proceed through these uh, nativity scenes, you'll see that Mary is often wearing blue. Originally, blue was the color associated with royalty, specifically with Byzantine empresses. And in the early fifth century, uh, at the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus, Mary was declared queen of heaven, spiritual mother, and intercessor. And after this declaration, blue began to be associated with Mary as royalty in her own right. Above Mary in the scene, a star shines brightly uh, right in the middle. And to the left and right of Mary are the three kings. I'm going to call them uh, magi because that's their label in Greek and um, also because they're never actually labeled as kings in the gospels. We owe the, the perception of them as kings to uh, pretty much to Renaissance art. Um, but on the left here is Balthazar. On the right are Casper and Melchior. Behind Mary, at the very, very back, you have to squint to see them, are the shepherds, 
uh, crowding in to try and have a look at the baby. Immediately in front of the shepherds uh, is a donkey eating hay. All the while, angels hover above the holy family. The unusual thing about Gossard's nativity is that it's set within a decaying building, but this is an intentional move used to contrast the fall of the classical world, right, Greco-Roman paganism with the birth of a new order and that new order being Christianity. In thinking about the composition of the scene, we might compare Gossard's painting to a similar, if not more familiar tableau in Sandro Botticelli's Mystic Nativity. Here, the Holy Family is under a thatched roof pitched over the opening to a cave. And if you're wondering why there's a cave here, I promise I'll return to this question in just a second. But uh, also in the scene, right, animals peacefully uh, watch on in the background. Uh, the infant Jesus reaches up to Mary, who's again draped in a blue robe. And the three magi uh, appear on the left-hand side, guided by an angel, and on the right-hand side, the shepherds appear, and they're also guided by an angel. And above uh, the holy family, right, the angels circle, uh, a troop of angels are circling around the dome of heaven. So we have two really compelling nativity scenes here. How do they compare to the biblical text? Well, only two of the four gospels mention Jesus's birth, right? And those are Matthew and Luke. Mark and John skip over Jesus's infancy entirely and just cut straight to his adult life. The birth narratives in Matthew and Luke, however, are thoroughly different and often mutually contradictory. For example, the Gospel of Luke is the only place we find the shepherds, the inn, the manger, the census, or travel to Bethlehem. It's only in the Gospel of Matthew that we find the Magi, the star in the east, the killing of babies on the command of Herod, or the flight into Egypt. So unlike the nativities that Gossart and Botticelli present, there is no gospel story in which all of these elements appear together. Further, the three magi that we uh, are so familiar with and accustomed to seeing in these scenes is an invention of later tradition. While Matthew indicates the presence of magi, he doesn't tell us how many there were. There could have been two, there could have been three, there could have been five, there could have been 20. Who knows, right? Western tradition um, delineates three magi um, because of the mention of three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, with the assumption that each of the uh, men carried his own gift, right? But this is far from an obvious assumption, and this tradition doesn't even arise until the third century. But in the Eastern, uh, in the tradition of Eastern Christianity, there's a text called the Revelation of the Magi, and it claims there are actually 12 uh, Magi. So a discrepancy between Eastern and Western traditions. But the names of the three men, right, uh, that I mentioned earlier, Balthazar, Malchior, and Caspar, also don't appear in Matthew, and these are also a much later development. Also notable in Matthew's narrative is that the Magi visit a house. Right? They don't go to an inn or a stable. Um, the house uh, it mentioned in Matthew seemed to be where Mary and Joseph are living in Bethlehem. Right? And the visit of the Magi is as late as two years after Jesus's birth. Matthew 2.16 records Herod's orders to kill baby boys up to the age of two based on the report from the Magi. By contrast, Luke's timeline of Jesus's birth is much narrower lasting only about 40 days to account for the period of purification uh, after giving birth. Luke also indicates that Mary and Joseph had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem for the census, and it was on this trip that Mary gave birth. Luke tells us that after birthing Jesus, Mary wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because, as we're all familiar with the saying, there was no room at the inn. Although Luke doesn't explicitly say that the space containing uh, the manger was a stable, this is the assumption that has become embedded in the imagination of artists. So to be honest, right, we could spend all day on just one of these discrepancies, but I want to address one aspect of the nativity scenes that doesn't get talked about very much, and that's the animals. Where do they come from? 
Matthew doesn't mention any animals in his narrative and neither does Luke. Yet almost every single nativity scene has some combination of a donkey, an ox, sheep, goats, dogs, and sometimes camels. Giotto's painting, now on your screen, has a horde of animals, right? In that corner down there, there's a dog, there's sheep and goats, right? We have the uh, ox and the donkey in the center of the scene. Why are they here? The most obvious answer, as the famous Christmas carol goes, is that the shepherds watched their flocks by night. Right, so it stands to reason that the shepherds brought their flocks along with them when they came to see Jesus. This is indeed the inference that artists like Giotto have made. But if we're thinking about this scene in comparison to the biblical text, which we are, Luke doesn't say that the shepherds brought their flocks with them, nor does he make any mention of animals being present during the adoration of the shepherds. So the presence of sheep, goats, and dogs in the scene only furthers the imaginative supposition about the stable setting of the nativity. But what about the donkey? Here it is front and center in Giotto's painting, right? It was in Botticelli's nativity and it was one of the very few animals besides dogs uh, in amid Gossart's ruins. So isn't this the donkey that carried the pregnant Mary on its back to Bethlehem? The tradition of the dutiful donkey, as it's become known, is illustrated in this 1320 Byzantine mosaic. Here we see a pregnant Mary clad in blue atop uh, a donkey, right? On the left is Joseph sort of trailing behind and on the right is Joseph's son. Interestingly, the presence of Joseph's son is a nod to the tradition that Joseph was a widower and already had children before he was paired with Mary. This is important in tradition, right? Because it alleviates any suspicions about Mary's sexual purity by interpreting the mentions uh, in the gospels about Jesus' siblings or brothers as just Joseph's sons from a previous marriage. But, but back to the donkey. Despite uh, this tradition of the donkey carrying Mary, nowhere in Matthew or Luke does it say that a pregnant Mary rode a donkey. Luke doesn't mention anything about transportation in the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And remember, in Matthew, Joseph and Mary are already living in a house in Bethlehem, so there's no need for a donkey at all. So where did the donkey in the nativity come from? Perhaps a 13th century mosaic from the apse of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome can help us answer this question. Here we have the donkey plus an ox. Right, we have the cave. I promised we'd come back to the cave. So here we are circling around. And we have the star from Matthew shining down on the nativity scene. We have the shepherds and angels and manger that's, that are mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. And all of this is located near a structure which is probably intended to be a stable. So to understand the scene and all its elements, we have to dive into Gospels that didn't make it into the Bible. An immensely popular second century text known as the Proto-Gospel of James offers an elaboration on Luke's birth narrative. And it's in this text that we finally encounter an association between Mary and a donkey. In the text, it's said that Joseph saddled up a donkey and put Mary on it to ride the long journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem in order to register in the census. On the way, Mary had to give birth, quote, when they came to the middle of the journey, Mary said to him, Joseph, take me off the donkey. The child is pushing from within me to let him come out. So he took her off the donkey and he said to her, where will I take you and shelter you in your awkwardness? Right, poor Mary, uh, this is a desert. And he found a cave and led her there and stationed his sons to watch her while he went to find a midwife. The presence of the cave and the donkey in the nativity scenes comes directly from this text. But the story doesn't end here. An even later text from the seventh or eighth century called the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew elaborates even further on this narrative. The text says that on the third day after the birth, the most blessed Mary went forth out of the cave and entering a stable, she placed the child in a manger and the ox and the donkey adored him. In pseudo Matthew's narrative, we have the first explicit mention of a stable as the setting for the nativity. 
which the author then ties directly to the manger. But the birth doesn't occur in the stable, it occurs in the cave. Pseudo Matthew connects all of these dots together, right? Manger, stable, cave, and then also animals. And in his explanation for the animals, we get another explanation for the donkey, who along with the ox comes to adore Jesus. This isn't just happenstance though, right? These two animals are placed into the nativity as messianic prophecy fulfillments. So uh, again, playing on the language of Isaiah and Habakkuk, right? We have Isaiah, which reads, the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib. And Habakkuk 3.2, which says, between two animals, you are made manifest. Right, so we have uh, an interpretation of much later uh, prophecy fulfillment right inserted into this text here to, to make sense of all of these elements. And so it's from the gospel uh, of pseudo Matthew and also the proto gospel of James, not the biblical text that the cave and their and the animals find their way into visual representations of the of the nativity. So while the cave has waned in popularity as a backdrop for contemporary nativity scenes, the animals are still ever present. But interestingly, not all of the animals that make an appearance in Pseudo Matthew made it into modern tradition. Besides the onky, the onky, besides the donkey and the ox, Pseudo Matthew also includes lions, leopards, and even dragons who come to adore Jesus. This presents us with a scene that looks something like this, right? I've taken some liberties here with Botticelli's nativity, adding in a dragon, a leopard, and a lion. But if we're being honest, the presence of these creatures in the nativity is no less unbiblical than the presence of the donkey or the ox, right? Or any animal for that matter, right? So if you see a, a dragon in your local nativity play this year, right, just remember, that is just about as accurate as, as the donkey and the ox. So anyway, why do these inaccuracies that we see in visual representations of the nativity matter? The thing that we should be mindful here of here is the reading practice that has engendered these scenes. The practice of synthesizing disparate details from different texts and traditions to present a single unified story is called harmonizing. Historically, harmonizing has been the most popular way to read and to picture the Gospels because it erases the differences between the text to produce a coherent narrative, in this case, about the birth of Jesus. But many biblical scholars would argue that it's actually problematic to harmonize because the differences of each Gospel really do matter. Each Gospel author is a storyteller. And each of the Gospels is a story intended to inspire and instill faith in its respective audience. But the Gospel authors do this in very different ways. Matthew's Gospel gives us a different image of Jesus than does Luke's Gospel. Because of these narrative differences, each birth narrative is functionally specific to its Gospel. Matthew's story of Jesus' birth makes no sense if you lifted it and put it into Luke's Gospel and vice versa. Right? You can't sort of mix and match these stories without them losing the integrity of the story the gospel author is telling. So if we harmonize these stories, we gloss over the diverse tastes, interests, and style of each author. Harmonizing, in essence, creates a new gospel that tells a completely new story about Jesus' birth that doesn't exist anywhere else. To put it bluntly, harmonizing changes the internal dynamics of the story. Right? If we put this in a more familiar context, we wouldn't, for example, take a collection of American short stories and argue that to understand a story by Mark Twain, we need to combine it with a story by Stephen Crane. Why wouldn't we do this? Well, because we assume that Mark Twain has something important and different to say from Stephen Crane. This is also true of the Gospels. Matthew has something different and important to say from Luke. Luke has something different and important to say from Matthew. So while it's not my intent to blow up the quintessential expression of Christmas here, right, it's also important to recognize that most nativity scenes, as they're depicted with this conglomeration of elements, rob each gospel author of his own unique understanding of Jesus, right? It's totally, like, we can totally appreciate these scenes, right? But just to be critical of the practice uh, of this harmonizing and what it entails. Okay, our third and final example today, 
is Mary Magdalene. So imagine devoting your time and energy to support a fledgling religious movement, only to have history remember you as one of its greatest whores. Right? This is the story of Mary Magdalene, who has been an incredibly popular subject in Western arts. Perhaps the most famous of all visual representations of Mary Magdalene is by the French painter Georges de la Tour. The painting casts a contemplative mood with its contrasts of light and shadow. Mary gazes into a mirror, which is a symbol of vanity, and this mirror, the vanity, is juxtaposed with a candle, likely symbolizing spiritual enlightenment. Right? She holds a skull in her lap, which is a reminder of mortality. The scene is the perfect visual and emotional push and pull for a woman renowned as a repentant prostitute. Right? In this image, we get it all. We get the sin and we get the self-reflective redemption. Millennia ago, however, she was best known for being a follower of Jesus and an important one at that. In all four gospels, she is among a group of women who stand by Jesus during the crucifixion and she's the first to bear witness to the resurrection. In the Gospel of John, she is alone uh, and the first to encounter the risen Jesus. Besides her place in resurrection narratives, we know by virtue of her name that she was from the town of Magdala, located on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. She is never identified in relation to another person, right? She's not anyone's mother, wife, or sister. Instead, her title, Mary of Magdala, implies some prominence in the city. And this seems to bear out, right? In Luke 8, 2 through 3, she, along with Joanna and Susanna, uh, are mentioned as supporting Jesus's ministry financially, right? So it seems that she's a woman of some means. Luke, as well as other gospels like Mark, mentioned that she was also once possessed by seven demons. And this is something that has also been used against her historically, but like most things in the Bible, that's actually much more complicated than a simple black or white issue. But that is for another talk on a different day. Mary Magdalene is also mentioned 12 times in the New Testament, making her the second most mentioned woman after Mary, the mother of Jesus. And in each and every mention, she is referred to by her whole title, Mary of Magdala. So really, it's not that difficult to confuse her with other Marys, but this seems to be somewhat of a historical sticking point. And you'll see that in just a second. But in the centuries since the gospels were written, she's been remembered differently than her privileged place in gospel narratives. In particular, she's been regularly remembered for her alleged erotic desire. And it's this remembrance that artists like George de la Tour have consistently enshrined. Accordingly, there are a number of tropes that pop up time and again in these visual representations. So let's take a look at two of Anthony Van Dyke's depictions of Mary Magdalene to suss out some of these tropes. So on the left, Van Dyke gives us a voluptuous Magdalene with long flowing hair staring heavenward. Beside her, a little angel conspicuously resembling a Cupid right, which is a personification of erotic desire, holds a jar of ointment. The presence of the little Cupid not so subtly signals Mary's association with lust and longing. Mary herself is draped in shimmering folds of satin fabric, right, this rich iridescent drapery alludes to her life as a prostitute ensconced in worldly pleasures. In the painting on the right, there is no Cupid, but Mary is wearing red shimmery satin, which many have read as a symbol of illicit lust and desire. In the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, right, red was a color with various meanings depending on its shade. Right, two hues of red were often most differentiated. Uh, the first was sort of a noble deep red, right, which you often see Jesus, Joseph, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, wearing. Uh, and the second red was an, uh, the, an earthly red, right, a shade of vermilion that tends toward the orange and the yellow. Um, this vermilion red typically symbolizes some combination of redemption, sin, and lust. And Mary Magdalene, of course, is associated with this earthly red. So here she is in this painting, right, uh, in her satiny vermilion uh, robe, or whatever uh, type of clothing that is, right, and she has long flowing hair, right. An ointment jar is placed at the edge of the scene um, near the skull, which again is a 
meditation on mortality. So Mary's long hair and the ointment jar in these images pushes us into the biblical text. The long hair is a reference to her traditional identification with the sinful woman of Luke 7, 36 through 50, who anoints Jesus' feet with ointment, hence the presence of the ointment jar, and then dries his feet with her hair. So I'm going to pop this passage up here. This is long, so we're not going to go through it, but I've highlighted some things we're going to come back to in just a second. So the identification of Mary as a sinful woman uh, serves as the dominant narrative about her. But if we look at this passage, right, just scan it, just scan it real quick, and you'll see that Mary's name isn't there at all, right? Mary isn't mentioned in this passage in any respect. The woman who's in this passage is actually unnamed, right? And her sin is also unnamed, right? She's simply described as a woman in the city who was a sinner, or later simply as a sinner. There's absolutely no clue that the sinful woman is Mary Magdalene. In chapter 12 of John's gospel, by contrast, the woman performing the anointing is named, but context tells us that it's Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, not Mary Magdalene. Versions of this anointing story also occur in Matthew and Mark, where the woman is also unnamed, um, but there's a variation uh, in the anointing where she anoints Jesus's head instead of his feet. So the misguided identification of these women with Mary Magdalene became concretized in a very public homily given by Pope Gregory I in Rome in 591. In the homily, Gregory conflates three different women into Mary Magdalene. So let's take a look. This is what Gregory, this is part of Gregory's uh, homily, right? So Mary of Magdala saw the Lord after his resurrection and drawing near embraced his feet. Lord, I asked, what hands are these that grasp your feet before my eyes? That woman who was a sinner in society, those hands which were stained with evil have touched his feet who is at the father's right hand above the angels. She whom Luke calls a sinful woman, whom J John names as Mary, I believe to be the same Mary from whom Mark says that seven demons had been cast out. It is evident, my friends, that a woman previously used the ungent to perfume her flesh in forbidden acts. What she had earlier used disgracefully for herself, she now laudably offered for the Lord. She converted the number of her faults into the number of virtues so that she could serve God as completely in repentance as she had rejected him in sin. So there's a lot going on here, right? Besides stripping three women from the gospels of their identity, Gregory explicitly links the ointment to perfume used in the solicitation of sex. Gregory identifies the unnamed sin of the unnamed woman in Luke as lust and desire. Then by equating her with Mary Magdalene, Mary becomes a prostitute. Thus the three women turn into one woman with a history of sexual sin. Although nowhere is Mary labeled a sex worker in the Bible, Gregory holds her up as an example of true atonement, right? The thinking goes, if a sex worker can be redeemed, well, anybody can, right? It's, it's an instructive uh, mode of teaching, right? That Gregory's trying to do here. Mary Magdalene's reputation as a prostitute in need of repentance led to the development of a series of artworks known as Penitent Magdalene's. In these scenes, Mary is in meditation of her sins and is frequently depicted as a hermit in the wilderness, lamenting her formerly sinful lifestyle. Exemplified here by Annabali Karachi's 1599 painting, Mary's, Mary's crying, right? If you look closely, there are tears streaming from her face. She has a heavenward gaze and she has retreated into the wilderness as all signaling her repentance. Right, she holds a skull in her lap, which again is a reminder of her second chance in relation to her own mortality. Here, though, there's a difference, right? She wears blue. So we've now transitioned from her uh, as in sort of ensconced in sin, right, to blue being a sign of her redemption. You may have noticed that many of the penitent Magdalene's depict Mary as a fully fleshed, sensuous young woman showing a fair amount of skin. This is particularly true of Titian's Penitent Magdalene and Victor Honoré Janssen's The Penitent Saint Mary Magdalene, 
Both Titian and Janssens use Mary's body to juxtapose her repentance with her sin. Titian places the ointment jar in clear view, shining in the light as the light also highlights Mary's body and her contemplative expression. In Janssen's painting, Mary again wears blue, marking her change again to temperance, but the light highlights her body as well as her contemplative face. In both scenes, Mary's flesh is held in tension with her redemption. As many scholars have noted, the sexualization of Mary can almost be certainly read as the manifestation of an erotic fascination of the male gaze, using an ostensibly pious saint as a subject, but a subject which conveniently allows for her sexualization as a result of her association with prostitution. The historian Susan Haskins describes these eroticized penitent Magdalens as kinds of penitential pinups. Yet we should note that in contrast to the young, attractive women presented in these paintings, whose bodies are used to highlight lust and desire and also redemption, the gospels, the gospels give no indication of Mary's age or appearance, right? For all we know, Mary uh, could have been a middle-aged wrinkly widow, right? We have no idea. So what's the big deal about these embellished stories and depictions of Mary Magdalene? Well, Mary's extensive history of sexualized reception uh, can be placed within a lineage of other sexualized women from the ancient world, right? The cup of Western culture, after all, overflows with erroneous depictions of over-sexualized women like Eve, Helen of Troy, or Cleopatra. In Mary's case, her sexualization and blending with other women destroys the integrity of the gospel text. Right? It also erases the presence of a multiplicity of women in the Gospels, as well as Mary's privileged place as an important disciple in the early Jesus movement. So looking back at what uh, we've talked about the last however many minutes, the art associated with these three scenes that we've considered today are all visual commentaries on the biblical text. Right? They enlarge it, they enrich it, but they also prompt a different type of comprehension about the events and figures than we find in the Bible text itself. The ideas about Paul's Damascus Road experience, the elements in the nativity scene, and a penitent Mary Magdalene, all these ideas that we've inherited from centuries of Christian art don't preserve textual accuracy, but they're powerful statements, right? They're coherent, compelling stories that visualize some form of underlying piety, and this is why they've been so successful. And while we can certainly appreciate both the biblical source texts and their artistic expressions, we should also be cognizant and critical of the implications that follow when art gets things wrong about the Bible. So that's it. Thank you. I shall stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing lots of wonderful artworks with us. Um, so if anybody has questions, please feel free to jot those in the chat and I will keep an eye on it. Um, in the meantime, while you are thinking, I have um, a couple questions I'm curious about. So you focused on images of penitent Magdalene in your talk. Um, and I'm interested in hearing a little bit about um, recent depictions of Mary Magdalene in sort of popular culture. Um, and in particular where she's kind of labeled as Jesus's wife or lover. And you see those things in, in popular films and books like the Da Vinci Code. Um, so I don't know, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, thank, thanks for the question, right? It, the pictures or the ideas about uh, Mary Magdalene, right, being the wife of Jesus, whether in the Da Vinci Code or in the recently debunked manuscript fragment known as the Gospel of Jesus's Wife, right, which actually turned out to be a forgery. Um, these also play on this history of uh, Mary uh, being eroticized, right? And they also play on sort of a misinterpretation of second century gospels. So the Da Vinci Code, for example, decides to base Mary's relationship with Jesus on the gospel of Philip, right? Which says that Mary used to kiss Jesus on the 
and then there's a hole in the manuscript, right? We don't actually know what it says, right? So people fill in that little blank and they put lips, right? But it could easily probably be cheek. It could be hand, right? Um, most scholars based on the size of the letters actually think that it says cheek, right? So this eroticized reading of the scene probably actually isn't there, right? Mary is definitely a close companion of Jesus, like other disciples are, um, but that that companionship for whatever reason, because of the sort of fascination with the erotic, right, gets gets totally and completely misinterpreted. But it comes out of the same vein um, that I'm talking about here. So we can thank we can thank Pope Gregory for that. So that's actually a perfect segue. Uh, we have a question in the chat um, about Pope Gregory. Why was it that his homily? How how was it legitimized? Why why did that happen? How was that allowed? So great. So to be totally honest, Gregory wasn't the first to draw these associations between uh, Mary and sort of illicit sexual desire. There had been other authors who had um, written about these connections as well. But because Gregory had this platform and because this homily um, was so publicly delivered and then sort of reinforced within church um, teaching and uh, ideas later down the road, right? This is how it sort of seeped in and then grew roots um, in church doctrine, right? The Catholic Church didn't renounce this view until like 1969, I think, or seven, it's either 72 or 69, right? When the Catholic Church said, yeah, this isn't exactly how uh, Mary Magdalene is mentioned in the Gospels, right? But I mean, what, that's like 1400 years? of this idea just constantly getting repeated and repeated and repeated, right? Um, so once that sinks in, it's, it's very hard to untangle and break that chain. Thank you. Um, so I, that also leads me into another question. So thinking about these additional texts that end up I don't know, becoming part of like the biblical narrative, at least through art. Um, can you explain a little bit more about what the pseudo gospels are? And sort of uh, how they came about? What do we know about them? So anything that's not uh, canonized in the Bible, right, the four gospels are referred to as apocryphal gospels. And these are usually texts that were written in the second century and later, right? So we have gospels being written um, Right, there's a lot, there's a lot of gospels, right? And they're being written concurrently uh, with the canonical gospels, but as like my talk indicated, you get gospels being written and revised all the way into the eighth, ninth, 10th centuries, right? Where they're super, super popular and constantly reproduced, right? So uh, they get weird names just because they're later. So like um, pseudo Matthew, right? It's written under the name of Matthew, but we know that Matthew didn't write that text. So it gets named as pseudo Matthew. Um, Proto James simply is a way to refer to a gospel that addresses the birth narrative, right? So it's like an infancy gospel. So all of these sort of apocryphal gospels um, are just sort of later fan fiction, um, to put it in sort of modern terms of the canonical gospels. I like that fan fiction. That actually really, I think that that helps me understand it more. Um, we have a couple of good comments here. The paintings are whitewashed. For sure, for sure. For sure. Right. And that's something I didn't talk about, right? Was that the images of Mary Magdalene and Paul, right? And, and well, pretty much almost anybody in these, in these scenes, right? It's a very Euro um, depiction of, of these images for sure. Another comment regarding um, Greek Orthodox tradition and that in the case of Mary Magdalene, the differences in the visual traditions between East and West are, are big. Yeah, so in the Eastern tradition, Mary Magdalene never gets dragged. Um, she doesn't get this association with prostitution or illicit lust and desire, right? She's held up as, um, well, according to her <laughs> privileged place in the gospel. So. In Eastern icons, you'll see Mary holding a red egg, right? And this, uh, there's a story, right, that after her encounter with the risen Jesus, she went to Rome to tell the emperor Tiberius, right, that Jesus was risen. 
And then Tiberius responds to her, uh, yeah, right, right. Jesus is risen as much as that egg on that table is red, right? So she goes and picks up the egg and then, you know, it turns red. And so you'll see um, this, this uh, iconography of her with the egg um, and that's all in the Eastern tradition, right? That doesn't get translated into the West. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, Jamie, thank you again. This is fantastic. Um, I wait. I want to make sure I didn't print. Oh, actually, sorry. I did miss one question. We'll do this one last one. Um, were there few people of African descent during this time, or was this intentional in the depictions? Um, also, I noticed you spoke on passages left out of the well-known Bible. And then I think the, is there art that depicts these passages and how do they compare to the depictions we saw today? Um, so the representations of Africans in art uh, is tricky. Um, so often at least one of the Magi get pictured as uh, usually Ethiopian. Right, so later tradition has that uh, the Magi came from one from Ethiopia, one from uh, Persia, and then one I can never remember because the tradition changes. Right, but the Magi was a technical term for Zoroastrian astrologer priests originally. Right, uh, Magi translates into English as magician, but um, usually that's the only time you get sort of Africans presented in these scenes is. Uh, in association with the Magi, right? You get, there's a huge tradition in Greco-Roman art, right? All the way through uh, late antiquity of Africans being represented, but it's, they're all usually sensationalized um, and highly eroticized uh, depictions. So that's a complicated question. Um, what was the second half of that? Uh, says, I noticed you spoke on passages left out of the well-known Bible. Are these, is there art that depicts those passages and how do they compare to the depictions we saw today? Yeah, so uh, that the apse of Santa Maria Maggiore, right in Rome, is 100% straight out of the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, right? It depicts with pretty much stunning accuracy, minus the dragon, the leopards, and the lion, but it depicts almost precisely the scene that the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew describes. Um, so yes, uh, these scenes are presented, but they're always sort of tempered with canonical elements, right? So even in that scene, we have elements from Luke and we have elements of Matthew that get put together, right? Which gives the scene an air of, you know, authority. Oh. Well, Dr. Gunderson, thank you so much for taking the time today. It's always great to look at art through another lens and we, we appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.